Thank you everybody for joining us today. I know that today that many of us are carrying a lot of tension and stress um, due to the you know, um, election results, right? And so many of us know that right now we just have to be patient and wait for those results, right? As, as they come in, but hopefully you've joined us today in order to, um, to celebrate this recent um, publication of queer and trans migrations. Um, by these amazing authors who are with us today. And so I just wanna give the a gran bienvenida to everybody. Um, thank you for joining us here today. Gracias a todos. Buenas tardes. Um, and to get us going, um, like always, this is something that we do in our classes um, and in our courses, um, in our special events, we would like to do a lag acknowledgement to get us going and to center us. Some of us are arriving to this moment, struggling to catch our breath. And we continue to be unsure of what the outcome will be and even more anxious about what happens after. Pero gente, we are here, estamos presente, we are present. So first and foremost, I would like to take a, a couple of deep breaths as part of this land labor and life acknowledgement that we would like to do today. As you know, taking deep breath allows us to pause and center ourselves, especially during what has been a hectic week for many of us. Each breath reminds us to reconnect with our body, allows us to release the stress and the tension that we're carrying. I wanna give a special shout out to our colegas um, in Pan-African Studies and Dr. Melina Abdullah, who crafted some of these statements I will be sharing with you today. And what better way to recenter ourselves by paying respect to our relations and to our ancestors? So if all of you can join me um, on our first deep breath and let us all breathe in. And breathe out. I would like to take notice that we are an occupied and stolen territory that is that we, I, I'm currently situated in. I'm currently located um, in Orange County, um, which is the ancestral ter ter territory of the Tongva the Gabrielino people and the Hashkama people, the First Nation people of this region. I also would like to acknowledge the occupied territory that you might be um, on right now. And if you would like, you can share its indigenous name. You can say it out loud. You can share it on Facebook. You can also share it on the, on the chat. If you don't know, you can always look it up at um, www.nativeland.ca. We pay respect to all indigenous people, past, present, and future, to show reverence and to call in their continued presence and to call in our ancestral knowledge within these spaces and institutions, even within these virtual Zoom spaces. So let us all take another deep breath. Let's breathe in and breathe out. We pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel, and forced into labor who were called slaves, but never submitted as such, who have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and each other. We honor our African ancestors for their still unpaid labor, which built what is now known as the Americas. Let's take another deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. To both our indigenous and African ancestors who face their own share of great odds, let us commit to this continued struggle for liberation. Let us remind ourselves that we are all ancestors in the making, and it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor to our relatives and leave behind a greater possibilities for those who come after. To all, all relations, aho ashe. Thank you. Gracias, Rafa. Uh, we just want to also thank our uh, collaborators and co-conspirators for this um, event, the Cross-Cultural Center and Laura Tejeda and the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Cal State LA. Uh, and of course, our department, the Chicanex Latinx Studies Department. Thank you to my colegas, Rafa and Danny, Daniel Topete and Rafa Sorotano for um, helping me uh, uh, welcome our panelists, and we'll say more about that. But for now, Danny, if you can tell folks what we're doing with the speaker series. So um, as you might have noticed in the flyer, again, this is, uh, as uh, 
as a professor and Anita Tijina referred to, right, this uh, 1200 series, um, as we kind of get together to, you know, create these bridges between not only ourselves, but our community as well, those folks who are coming in to, you know, speak with us about their wonderful work. Um, some of uh, uh, the uh, folks who actually I, uh, I remember uh, from doing my MA and uh, like uh, Bambi Salcedo, I remember seeing them around campus and working on, you know, uh, our MA at the same time with Carla Padron. And um, again, just to kind of make those connections to to uh, multiple spaces, you know, and um, to really also uh, bring in uh, uh, to our students specifically right on the 1200 series, but you know, uh, everyone in the community in general, right, these wonderful speakers. Um, next uh, week, actually two weeks, we did have to reschedule on um, November 18th at 12.30 um, to 1.30. We're gonna have another uh, Cal State alum, um, uh, Dr. Steven Osuna. I come and talk to about uh, a couple of their pieces, but specifically uh, their abstinent transnational memories, uh, oral histories, and how they shape Salvadoran Mexican subjectivities, um, among their other work, and uh, specifically here to again make those connections to um, some of the you know work that some of our students are, are doing already with their own oral history um, projects and bringing these voices to the forefront. Thanks, thank you so much, Daniel, um, for sharing about our speaker series. Um, let me just share with everybody what we have planned today as part of um, this program about this amazing panel that we're bringing to you uh, live. Um, so the way we're gonna be structuring this book talk slash um, fireside chat is that for the first couple of minutes, 15 minutes, we're gonna hear from our editors um, and talk about the book and the vision of their book and um, what, what they hope to set out with this book. And then after that, we're gonna go into this kind of like fireside chat where we have some questions um, for our contributors who are here with us today. And they're gonna be sharing about their pieces. And so, and then afterwards for the last um, 30 minutes, we will have uh, this kind of like question and answer period where we will collect questions from our webinar attendees and also um, from Facebook Live. So I just wanna let you know, you could submit your questions um, with us um, through the webinar, but also you could submit your questions through Facebook and we'll be checking um, both sites to make sure that we, we catch your question. But let me go ahead and introduce our editors and then our contributors. So we can go ahead and hear about, and begin this amazing discussion. So first and foremost, I would like to introduce everybody, and I'm going to read the 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 country, you know, the computer, the contributors' um, profiles from the book. So here's the book, y'all. It's beautiful. Um, the first person I'm going to read off is Ethna Luhine. Um, they are a professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Arizona. She holds a PhD in ethnic studies from UC Berkeley, and her research focuses on the connections among queer lives state immigration controls, and justice struggles. She is the author of Pregnant on Arrival, Making the Illegal Immigrant, and Entry Denied, Controlling Sexuality at the Border. And also one of the key um, editors of the first Queer Migrations um, edited text, um, which I know for many of us uh, on this panel inspired us, right, and influenced us in, in our work. Our second editor is Karma Chavez. Um, Karma Chavez is the chair and associate professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She is the co-editor of Text Plus Field Innovations in Rhetorical Method and Standing in the Intersections, Feminist Voices, Feminist Practices in, in Communication Studies. She is the author of Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric, and Coalitional Possibilities, and the recent publication of Palestine's, Palestine on the Air. Thank you for being here with us. And let me share a little bit about our contributors. Our first contributor is the amazing and former colega of mine, Jack Caraves. 
Jacket Alves is an activist scholar and assistant professor of women and gender sexuality studies at San Jose State University. Their research and activism takes an intersectional lens to understand how gender works as a structure of power to discipline and police queer and trans people of color. Their research uses community-based mixed methods, approaches, in-depth interviews, and participatory observation and focuses on the experience of trans Latinx in Southern California. Thank you for being here, Jack. Thank you. Our next contributor is a, a famous activist here from our hometown, Los Angeles, um, Bambi Salcedo. Bambi is a transgender Latina woman who received her master's degree in Chicana X and Latin X studies from here, Cal State LA. She is a president and the CEO of the Trans Latina Coalition, a national organization that focuses on addressing the issues of transgender Latinas, Latinos in the United States. Bambi has developed the Center of Violence Prevention and Transgender Wellness, a multi-purpose, multi-service um, space for transgender people in Los Angeles. Bambi was, um, has also been invited to participate on several panels at the White House, including in 2016, the United State of Women, where she shared the stage with Vice President Joe Biden at the opening plenary session. Thank you for being here, Bambi. And lastly, our amazing Central American Honduran scholar, La Suyapa Portillo. Suyapa is an associate professor of Chicana, Chicano, Latina, Latino, Transnational Studies at Pittsburgh College and a member of the Intercollegiate Department of Chicana X, Latin X Studies at the Claremont Colleges. As a Fulbright Scholar Fellow to Honduras in 2018, she studied root causes for migration and displacement. She has served as an expert witness for numerous LGBTI Central American asylum cases and is a historian of Honduras and Central America. Um, please join me in giving them a round of applause, this amazing crew. Gracias a todos. And so to get us started, as promised, um, we want to begin our discussion tonight um, by hearing from the authors, right, from hearing from the editors. And so we would like to hear what was your vision for your book? And I would like to pass it on to the editors. You have the floor. We wanted to really extend warmest thanks to you, Rafael and Anita and Danielle, for organizing this opportunity for us to actually just have a conversation with everybody. Thank you so very much. Thank you to the Department of Chicanx Latinx Studies, um, Laura, the Cross Cultural Centers. We, I want to thank everybody who's taking time to be here, to be with us in conversation at this difficult moment. Um, and I want to thank all the contributors. I also want to say Rafa is not just an organizer and host, but also a contributor who has a wonderful chapter in this book that makes a really unique contribution in terms of scholarship and make sure to read that work that is really pathbreaking work on bringing a geographical analysis to queer migration studies. So we wanted to tell you a little bit about what prompted us to create this book. And that has to do with both the political and the historical moment that we're in and where we think scholarship and public discussions are at. We'll talk a little about why we thought it was important to have academics, activists and artists in conversation and the kinds of work that we hope the book can inspire. So we decided to work on the book after we co-organized a conference on queer migration in 2014, which happened just before the so-called child migrant crisis that summer. Uh, we envisioned the book as a companion to Ethna's earlier co-edited volume, Queer Migrations, Sexuality, U.S. Citizenship and Border Crossing, which centered queer of color migrants and communities and questions of border crossing and citizenship. 
my book, Queer Migration Politics, which Rafa mentioned, was also in print and, and lucky for me, widely circulating. Uh, and there was a growing body of work in trans migration studies. And so it seemed like the right moment to broaden the conversation about queer and trans migration studies to take up increasingly urgent issues of criminalization, detention, and deportation. So we put out a call for papers for the book in 2017. So now you can see how long it takes for a book to actually come into being. And this was, of course, as everyone was living with the dire effects of the newest rounds of racial capitalism, colonialism, settler colonialism, and state terror. All of them, of course, working through normative gender and sexuality logics. So under these kinds of conditions, as folks gathered here know very well, because you work on this, untold millions of people around the world continued being forced into migration. And yet countries like the United States that play a key role in generating migration, including through their unjust trade and economic policies, through invasion, through warfare, through policies fueling the climate crisis, and so on and so forth, are not addressing their role in generating migration, and instead further slamming the door, building the wall, and criminalizing migrants. We know that we knew, I mean, we all know and we knew then too that these responses have routed untold numbers of people into situations where they risk their safety and their lives and live under conditions of exploitation <clears throat> while being ineligible for the most basic of assistance or care and remain vulnerable to separation from family or friends at any moment through deportation. And we also know that legally present migrants are increasingly criminalized and routed into detention and deportation as well. And that people seeking asylum are increasingly criminalized, penned up or driven out and subject to really extraordinary levels of violence, terror and abandonment. And we know this is in some ways particular to immigrants and yet it also stems from and legitimizes settler colonial racist heterosexist transphobic anti-poor policies and attitudes that deeply affect U.S. citizens. Further contributing to this situation we know there have been extraordinary levels of state and private investment in walls in cages in surveillance in cruelty, brutality, unaccountability, and state and corporate lawlessness, even while the most basic collective goods and services like food, shelter, healthcare, and education are rolled back, and people, migrants, and citizens alike are subjected to what Elizabeth Povanelli calls economies of abandonment and dispossession, which the pandemic has further exacerbated. We know that media and politicians, whether Republican or Democrat, frame migrants and marginalized US communities as somehow like causing the crisis. The contributors to this book flip the script. They call out the carceral nation state, corporations, and white supremacist, anti-Black, settler, colonial, and patriarchal logics and practices as the source of our crisis and is needing to be transformed or of course abolished. So we think that all of the contributions in the book in different ways help us to do a number of things. So for one, they help us to analyze and understand the current structures of power that are creating these conditions of dispossession and suffering. We also think they help us to make links among struggles so we can understand how the illegalization, detention and deportation of queer migrants connects with the movement for black lives, with feminist politics and with prison abolition. We also think it helps us to make connections among struggles at different scales, from the most local to the global, from, for nation state migration, detention, deportation and security regimes, draw from and cite one another to legitimate their actions, just like capitalism creates the scripts for countries and corporations alike to draw and exploit migrant labor and black, native, brown, female, poor, queer, and trans labor profiting at every step. We think contributors to this book also help us to document extraordinary histories of refusal, resistance, and dreaming and working toward a different world that's not just about surviving, but about thriving, starting not with rich white men, but with communities that have faced the most harm under this current system. 
And we also think they remind us that we all have a part to play in making change, which of course varies depending on your circumstances, but everything counts, everything matters, and every effort helps. We hope that this book acknowledges and honors important changes that we have seen over the last two decades, including that queer and trans migrants are increasingly visible at the forefront of extraordinary social movements, organizing efforts, and cultural work that has redefined how we understand and work for queer and migrant justice. In 2007, Queers for Economic Justice released Queers and Immigration, a vision statement, which envisioned transforming the immigration system in ways that centered the priorities of queer and trans people and communities that have been most harmed by the current policies. Since then, numerous activists, artists, and artivist groups, which in the United States include, and I'm just gonna name some because it's so amazing we can do this now, they include the Immigrant Youth Justice League, United We Dream, Culture Strike, which is now the Center for Cultural Power, the Queer Undocumented Immigrant Project, Familia Trans Queer Liberation, Mariposa Sin Fronteras, Trans Queer Pueblo, the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, the Black LGBTQ Plus Migrant Project, the Los Angeles Queer Contingent, and many, many others have made important inroads into checking the gender and sexual normativity of the immigration movement, setting queer and trans-centered migration agendas, challenging the treatment of trans and queer migrants in detention and in all aspects of everyday life, and so much more. And we also see this work around the world with organizations like the Forcibly Displaced Peoples Network, the African LGBTQI Migrant Network, Rainbow Refugee, Queer Refugees Deutschland, and many, many more. So in creating this beautiful book with a cover in original art by the amazing Julio Salgado. We didn't try to produce something that we claim is representative, which would be impossible, but instead we issued an open call that invited grounded cutting edge work that helps us understand the moment we're in and how to move forward in transformative ways. Queer and trans migrations remains heavy on contributors from and research about the United States. This troubling overrepresentation reflects US power and hegemony in the production and circulation of academic knowledge. The book is not intended to suggest that UX experiences are universal or generalizable, and contributors also engage with processes of illegalization, detention, and deportation in places like Turkey, Greece, Canada, as well as Native nations. The book was we had to do this. We were compelled to do this because of the urgency of the current situation, the need to continue having conversations and taking action, even when we're worn out, and the importance of making sure the work remains centered on racial, gender, sexual, economic, settler, colonial justice that begins from the priorities of those who have been most harmed. We know the situation is extremely difficult, and yet, We've also seen some at this as a time of great possibility with people coming together and demanding big changes that were not part of public conversations even a couple of years ago. And these include demands to abolish ICE, abolish detention, abolish DHS, abolish the police, abolish prisons, abolish racial capitalism, let migrants stay, and rebuild communities to ensure not just survival but thriving. The book is intended to document some of these histories and some of the tools that have helped us to get to this point. It is a work of love and thanks, and it is a call to keep going. And we did want to mention that all royalties will be do donated to support the organization Mariposa Sin Fronteras, which has been doing this kind of work for several decades. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that introduction to the book and, and the fabulous work that you all are doing. Um, I've invited folks in the chat to add some questions to the Q&A. 
Rafa, do you have any comments before we start some of the questions that we have prepared? I, I, I just wanted to appreciate all the naming um, that just went on right now and just appreciate the hard work and activism that they have been putting on for the last couple of years. And, you know, as um, I believe Karma or Ethno was naming them, I was like, yes, right? Abolish ICE, abolish the police. And I think um, this is the end goal. Thank you so much for sharing those words. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so we really do want to hear from the contributors and we want to welcome you to um, respond to the questions that we have in the way that you feel most comfortable. So you, know, you can speak to the question or you can just speak to the moment. You know, again, I think it's, it's a little surreal to be in this space, um, given where we are with the election and with the, the grief and the rage and the hope and, and the commitment and work that folks are actively engaged in right now, right? So I just wanna like, you know, acknowledge like, you know, we, we are connected to, to life outside of this Zoom. And also we are connected to life inside of this book uh, that you all, you know, kind of are bearing witness to um, and documenting. And so just, you know, again, many things, many, many things. And I will start with our first uh, prepared question, but as I, I put forward the questions, Feel free to ask other questions in response, um, and feel free to take take uh, you know take liberty to talk about the things that you would like to talk about. Uh, the first question uh, is, or, or the first comment that I'd like to make is that our contributors have different pieces in this book. Bambi is the executive director of the Trans Latina Coalition based here in Los Angeles, and one of the things that I was telling Rafa is like many scholars have begun, um, you know, have been writing about you, your life and your activism and, as, and journalists and community activists have as well. But I wonder if you could share with us about one, about your organization and two, how does it feel to have the opportunity to write your own piece in this text? Why is it important to tell your story? I know you've probably been telling that story so many times. So how did you choose this particular text to start sharing some of your work? Um, bueno, primero que nada, quiero darle gracias a mi poder superior, mi creador, por darme la oportunidad de poder aspirar y respirar un día más, ¿verdad? Um, también quiero honrar la gente que nos acompaña y también agradecer a las personas que me invitaron a, a esta sesión. Um, again, I, I know that probably some of you did not understand what I just said, but it is a customary thing that I do before I start speaking at any forum. Um, and so I just acknowledge my creator for giving me the opportunity to breathe one more day and also to aspire to be the best person that I could be today. Um, and obviously I have to acknowledge the beautiful and amazing people who are joining us today. And obviously I want to extend my humble gratitude to the beautiful and amazing people who invited me to be part of this stellar panel of individuals. Um, so thank you. Um, well, I, I guess I first want to um, acknowledge and say that, you know, the piece that I was able to write was specifically about the Trans Latino Coalition. Uh, and obviously it's been a couple of years, right? Since all of this took place. Um, but, you know, in all sincerity, um, it would not have been possible if it wasn't because of the collaboration that we, um, that we had and I had with um, my amazing and beautiful sibling, um, Jack Carabes. Um, you know, we were very lucky that um, when Jack was in the process of completing their um, doctorate degree, um, you know, we got together and we collaborated and, you know, we we produced a report that was specifically to highlight the healthcare needs and issues of trans Latinx individuals in Southern California. Um, and so from there, you know, we not just bonded a partnership, but I, I would say also a, um, como se dice, una hermandad, right? Um, and so I, I do have, you know, mad love and respect for Jack and for who they are and 
you know, for their presence in this world. Um, but I think, you know, as you said, Anita, right, as a mujer trans Latina migrante indocumentada, right, I, I have, you know, been yelling and screaming and, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, advocating for the specific needs and issues of my peoples, right? My sisters, like um, the people who I once stood on the corner with doing sex work and, you know, who I, you know, was navigating the streets with, who I also ran in prison with, right? And so, so it, it you know, the Trans Latino Coalition really, you know, came to exist because of a need, right? And so, you know, because I am a privileged trans woman, um, because I had the privilege to reform my life and because I had the opportunity to also enter into the world of academia, right? Um, you know, I, I feel that it's my responsibility to really ensure that um, I, in some ways, um, participate in our society as a voice for many members of our community who do not have the ability to speak. Um, and so, you know, the Trans Latino Coalition is and has been an amazing organization that has, you know, contributed and has actually um, uh, influenced in some ways, so in many ways, right? Um, the trans movement as a whole here in the United States of California and, um, and, and you know, although some organizations were mentioned who obviously are, you know, are sister organizations and partners and, you know, organizations that we have organized uh, over time, um, it was truly the Trans Latina Coalition, the first organization who started organizing in 2009 to specifically address the needs and issues of trans Latina immigrant women who were living in the United States. Um, and also, you know, in collaboration with, again, like one, another one of my amazing and beautiful siblings, Carla Padron, right? We generated a report to specifically highlight the needs and issues of trans Latina immigrant women who were living in the United States. So this was a national study and it was, to my understanding, the first one of its kind um, to really, um, again, you know, put forth the specific needs and issues of trans Latina individuals, trans Latina women who were living in the United States um, because we know that the society that we live in, right? I can scream and yell and advocate and shed places down, but if there's no documentation about the specific need, then what that means is that the need is non-existent, right? And so we have learned to, you know, tell our own stories, right? Um, and I'm just so glad that I, you know, that I get to be the president and the CEO of this organization that has, you know, stride and to make sure that, you know, we as a community continue to thrive and to exist. Um, but obviously the work that we do is not possible if it's not through the collaborations and, you know, and I also wanna say, you know, part of the historical um, work that we're doing is that even today in 2020, the Trans Latino Coalition is the first and only translator organization that is doing this work at the capacity that we're doing it, right? And not to negate the work of other translator organizations here locally, um, there's, uh, three others, but again, the services that we provide, the policy work that we do and everything else, like um, people are doing either or, uh, and even nationally, they're either doing one or the other, but not necessarily both. And we believe that the work that needs to be done in order for us to be at a better world within our society is to do the work, not just from the top down or from the bottom up, but in the multiplicity ways, right? Um, and so I'm just, again, honored and glad that I was able to participate in this amazing book. Um, and again, it would not have been possible if it wasn't because of the amazing partnership that um, we have had and we built with Jack and obviously 
everybody else. So thank you. Gracias, Bambi. Um, and Jack, we would love to hear uh, from you as well. I have a question, but again, take it where you like. Uh, your contribution is a collaborative piece with Bambi that highlights your work together. Can you share with us your take on writing this activist reflection piece? And how does your collaboration demonstrate what one of my our fellow colegas calls or, or refers to an intentional non-extractive community-based research project? It's a little bit wordy, but basically how do we do this work, right? Without extracting from the community and instead doing it as a collaboration and really being intentional about that work. Okay? Uh, again, you know, feel free to uh, just talk about your piece and your work however you like. Definitely. Um, thank you so much. And, and thank you first and foremost to Rafa for organizing and, and putting this together um, for the invitation for, to Ethna and Karma for you know, putting out that, putting out that call. Um, I'm so glad that, that I'm spending November 4th with all of you, 2020, because it's been a really interesting year and last few hours. So, um, and really, you know, thank you to, to Bambi, right? Like for what you just shared. And so I'll talk a little bit more um, about the collaboration and, and, and that. And so I think, you know, um, in terms of, you know, I, I received, I was, when I met Bambi, I was um, in graduate school um, doing my PhD in Chica, at that time, Chicana and Chicano Studies, and now it's Chicana, Chica, Chicana and Chicano Studies and Central American Studies Department. Um, and so I think a lot of my time was spent in terms of not only learning you know, or, or embarking on my own research, but also how to do research in a, you know, humanistic, non-extractive non -extractive way that is actually contributing to um, changes in, in society, right? Um, I think the way I was thinking about the work that I wanted to do was to, to build something and create something that would be accessible to people on the ground who were doing this work. And so when I got connected to Bambi um, and it, like I write in our reflection, right? Um, um, we built a connection and then over time, she invited me to collaborate with her and the organization on this needs assessment. And so as she said, this needs assessment and this collaborative, um, exchange was already something that was built into the work Trans Latino Coalition was already doing, right? Um, they had done that survey with Dr. Carla Padron. Um, so it was something that, that was already established. It just so happened that my values of how I did research aligned with what they were looking for, right? And I think that's why, as Bambi said, we've been able to really build this strong, not just collaboration, but also like friendship, right, in terms of, of, of what we're doing in terms of, um, of bringing visibility to this community. And so I think for me, you know, I can talk about, you know, we, we I talk about in the reflection how we use CBPR or community-based participatory research, right? Um, that's also what was used when Carla or Dr. Padron and Bambi um, put together the Transvisible Report of Trans Latina Immigrant Women in 2011, right? And so um, CBPR is often used in public health, but it really is this orientation to research that focuses on relationships between academics and community partners, right? It's something, it's, it's a framework that is really grounded in co-learning and mutual benefit, right? It's not about extraction, it's about, I came into the space knowing, knowing that, sure, I was a, at, the, at this, in, within the ivory tower, right? And coming from this very privileged position and coming into this community space, but also knowing that I was gonna be learning a lot more in that space than I would even in some of my classes, right? Um, because Bambi and all the people in the coalition are on the ground doing this work on the everyday. So why would I not, um, you know, 
why would I one not want to collaborate, but then also two be in collaboration with this really important work that that they're doing. And so I think for me, writing this re reflection is about giving credit where credit is due. Right. Um, I am in academia, and I might who knows how long I'll be here for, right? But, but for the foreseeable future, I'm gonna be writing and that's how I'm gonna keep my job, right? But I think we, as academics, we make choices about um, what conversations we wanna be a part of and, and where we pay that credit to. And so I think for me, you know, it was important that I asked Bambi, um, you know, and Bambi, if you know her, is extremely busy. Um, and, but I, you know, I had to ask, ask and keep asking Bambi, like, let's do this, let's submit this, you know, and, and it, it worked out and, and I'm really happy that it did to be able to, to, to put this piece together, because I think, you know, as I said, Bambi is somebody who's been a mentor to me, who has been somebody that I've learned so much from. So I think in terms of the research that I do, in terms of how it come to my own work, it, it, it is grounded in, in, in trying to pay credit where credit is due and also acknowledging that trans women have always been leading us to liberation, right? So I think that's part of um, the work that I've done, the work that I've done with the coalition and to, and to you know, bring, do my small part in bringing visibility to the work that Bambi and the members of the coalition are already doing. Absolutely, thank you. And, you know, I think uh, Rafa's work in Georgia, my work in Vegas, like it resonates so much with what you all are doing here in Los Angeles and across the country. Like the work is being done. We're just, uh, us academics are primarily uh, co-conspirators and helping to document it, but also, um, you know, be trying to do the work and be led by the visionary uh, trans and queer and feminist, mujerista, um, you know, leaders in our communities. And they have the vision and they have the, the strength. And so I'm, I honor that, that work. Thank you. Papa? You're on mute. There we go. Thank you. Um, again, I always say I, I do Zoom multiple times and I still talk when I'm muted. But the next question is going um, to Suyapa. Suyapa, you um, wrote a piece called Central American Migrants LGBTI Asylum Cases Seeking Justice and Making History. And so I, I really want us, if you could get, um, get us there, if we could begin to like talk about the lived experiences of, of queer trans migrants navigating the US immigration courtrooms when seeking asylum. Um, and so I have a few questions for you. So what led you um, to write such a critical piece in this, uh, in this book and what key findings and challenges, um, challenges were, um, were important to share with everybody? Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here with um, all of you. Uh, do, all of you are doing such amazing work in the community as well as in academia. Uh, thank you to the editors for including me. Um, you know, um, actually I've been doing this work uh, serving as an expert since 2000, I wanna say 2004. Uh, my first research trip to Honduras, I was introduced to what the communities are facing there. And in 2004, um, and I'm sorry, I have a note here. In 2004, I actually uh, began to document uh, kind of as a side project, why women were migrating. And I wrote a piece in Spanish because, and it was published in Honduras uh, about why people were migrating to Spain at the time Spain had just legalized marriage or the US. and I wrote it in Spanish because I felt like Hondurans needed to understand the situation. And for, you know, there's so much discrimination even before the coup d'etat of 2009. And, um, and so I had this little piece that I, you know, nobody would really kind of look at and then finally got published in Spanish, a piece of it. Um, and then I left it alone because what I started seeing in the courtroom when I was serving as an expert 
is that I would get attacked from my political from the state side because of my political views or because I write op eds. And so I was worried about writing this piece because I didn't want the piece to be used against me when I'm trying to argue um, for country conditions, you know? So sometimes like the attorneys would attack me on my Twitter feed or they would go on my Twitter feed or my Facebook. And uh, so I was worried about writing this piece and, and I have a lot of information that I'm always worried to talk about publicly because I want to be useful um, in the courtroom to, to be able to talk about what people face. Um, I write about Honduras and I was there to do a project on uh, the Banana. I'm a historian, so I was, look, I was looking at archival um, documents on the 1950s and I'm queer and I was lonely. So I found an organization to, hang, to go hang out with and play soccer, you know, play pool, like just something I could do while I'm doing research. And I ended up discovering um, an amazing group of people who, and I think Karma mentioned this, are not just like, there, there is a lot of oppression and, and violence in Honduras and in El Salvador and Guatemala, but there's a, a group of people that are in resistance as well, who are organizing, who are, who are living, who have a lot of agency. Um, this, this picture in my background is, is from last Pride, not this year, 2020, but 2019. Um, and, you know, even though people are, may not be out of the closet or they're rejected by their family, everybody still goes out um, to, to, to observe pride, which is really like a protest versus a, a party like we see in the US. Um, but I also saw extreme state abandonment. So for instance, in Honduras, there have been 367 murders of people, 118 of those murders are trans women and only 72 cases have been uh, investigated. And what we were seeing in the early 2000s uh, when the Red Lendica Catrachas was founded, which is an observatory of violence in Honduras, but it's been replicated throughout Central America and the Dominican Republic, uh, founded by uh, you know, a, a lesbian and, and trans man, um, that this organization um, is the only group in the entire region that can document the and and sort of follow the trail of what happens to trans folk and LGBTI folk in Honduras. And so uh, we're seeing really high numbers, for example, 19 murders from 2004 to 2009 uh, published by Human Rights Watch. But then in 2009, after the coup d'etat, which was orchestrated uh, with the support of the US uh, at the time, uh, Hillary Clinton, and Obama, um, the cases tripled, quadrupled. You know, it's it's 118 trans women. It's a lot of people for a country that has seven million population, right? So, um, and and I, you know, and so I was afraid to talk about this topic because I felt like because I get so attacked uh, and invalidated by uh, by the state when I'm in that courtroom. I'm always worried about it. So I'm, I'll stop there, but that's how I ended up. Um, you know, I think karma proposed the idea and I, I went with it. So, it, and what was interesting about it, it, it was interesting to reflect on I, I, how we're, how these uh, affidavits that we write or country conditions, currently I'm writing an amicus brief for a case in the um, Inter-American Court of, uh, of Human Rights and these documents, is, is about making history, right? We're, we're writing down history that 50, 100 years from now, people are going to research. Um, we're also making assumptions about those countries. Like it's sticky, you know, because my affidavit has to reflect country conditions, which are terrible. Um, and oftentimes there's no space or time. And oftentimes, you know, I'm, I'm very chatty as you can see, and either the, the state or the, the judge will shut me up, right? Like they don't wanna know any other details other than the question they're asking you. And so, so in these pieces is the only time I have to tell the story of Honduras, El Salvador or Guatemala. So if I talk about El Salvador, I have a whole section on you know, the 
uh, civil wars or revolutionary wars and the US uh, role in that. Like it's, it's like my responsibility to document that violence that occurred throughout uh, the 20th century in, in Central America, right? So, cause, I, cause in my mind, I'm like, this is gonna be a historical document. I gotta put this in there, you know? Um, anyways, I, I don't know if that answered your question. I think it answered the question and so much more because I think what so many of these pieces um, demonstrate throughout the book is the multiple ways in which we're engaged in some type of activism, right? Or resistance, right? Like. Um, Jack and Bambi's piece around even shaping public policy, right? How activism in moving some of the, um, you know, findings in that policy brief that they created, right? Can shape some of um, the policies that we write currently and push through our activism. And then also um, the ways in which you are involved in the courtroom. And then, which brings me to this next question about artists and artists and their artwork as being political. And so I really wanna pass this question on um, to Karma and Ethne, um, if you can share the importance um, of the artist contributions um, to the project um, and how does their, you know, integrating their works of, you know, works of these artists explore how LGBTQI uh, migrants experience and resist illegalization, detention and deportation. Karma. <laughs> You want me to start? Okay, sure. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Jack and Bambi and Suyapa for um, being a part of the book and for what you've had to say. Uh, continue to be inspired by you and um, grateful to have you represented. Rafa, you too, though we haven't heard from you yet about your piece. Um, I think one of the things that we were thinking was um, you know, academics, I mean, this gets back to the kind of the extractive notion of scholarship, but, you know, academics have a, have a way of um, documenting what others are doing and then becoming the expert in what others actually originated. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do in this book is to put activist artists and academics on a kind of so, somewhat of a level playing field, if, it, it, not that that's possible, right? But that was kind of the intention. And if you think about uh, the movement over the last decade or more, um, you don't have a movement without the artistic contributions of, of, of so many uh, folks. So folks in the book, but beyond that as well, um, who um, become the visual rhetoric of the movement and become that which people actually um, use to connect to the movement. And so, uh, you might know it's challenging to get um, high quality art in an academic book because academic books, um, they're not actually designed to make money for the publisher. Publishers usually lose money on books. And so we really had to fight um, to, to give art a central place in the book. But we knew that if we didn't, um, we actually wouldn't be representing what's happening um, and we'd be excluding one of the most important voices. Thank you. Anita, I, I believe it's your turn. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I'm trying to do the technology and, <laughs> and um, the question. So we have, uh, we wanna get into uh, audience questions. So please um, feel prepared for that. <laughs> um, and then quickly, I would like to ask Bambi a question because I know that so many of our um, students are in our department now, um, or, or many of them are in in this, um, are either watching the Zoom or will watch the Zoom. So we were wondering if we could ask you about your academic journey. We know that you decided to get a master's in Chicanx and Latinx studies at Cal State LA. And we're wondering what made you um, decide to pursue a degree in ethnic studies Maybe you could talk to us about the value of that. And then also um, tell us about your thesis, like what you wrote about. And, and if you're planning to uh, get it out in the world, we definitely want to read more and learn more from you. Um, well, 
Thank you. I think that's definitely a super important question, particularly for those individuals who are trying to find their themselves, you know, in this world. Um, and also as we are trying to be academics, right? Um, I think, you know, what I'm just, I, I'm just so lucky and privileged, you know, that um, through those challenging times, you know, and, you know, going through academia, right? Um, there were always beautiful and amazing people who supported me, you know, through the process, but also I think also what helped me uh, through my process was some of the readings that were assigned also, right? Um, that, you know, I reflected myself, you know? Um, and so as, as I was doing that through my process, um, I also saw, right, that, um, you know, although my beautiful and amazing um, colleague and friend, you know, Eddie Alvarez, Dr. Eddie Alvarez, uh, who is now in Fullerton, right, has, you know, as you mentioned, right, like written about me um, and other people has written about um, trans Latinas, right, uh, was amazing and great, but I also saw that there, at least to my knowledge, right, um, I could be wrong, but even through my research, right, um, there were no other trans Latina identified immigrant women who had written about other trans Latinas, right? And so for me, it was an opportunity, right? Um, you know, for me to write something that, um, that I thought it's also important, right? Like talking about documenting the stories of or our own stories, right? Um, and documenting the stories of my sisters that may not ever um, have the opportunity to tell their stories, right? And so my research focused on um, on documenting, you know, the uh, narratives of eight uh, trans Latinas uh, living in Los Angeles. And it just so happened to be that four were immigrants and four were you know, uh, U.S. natives, um, and and so it was just, you know, amazing, right? That I was able to um, to tell their stories uh, on a way that um, using obviously um, uh, two uh, theories, right? Um, which was. Um, Oh my God, which, uh, you know, the, um, don't which, worry. I don't remember half the things that I write. I, well, it's it, the truth. It was, I don't remember half the stuff that I write. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, telling their stories on it's, what is it called? Not, it's not narratives, but, um, testimonio. Testimonio. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, testimonials, um, and and yeah, so um, so it was just you know really that, but also you know looking at how you know what are the strategies that this trans woman used in order to live and survive in a marginalizing world, right? Um, and so so really like not just highlighting their horrible experiences, but also, you know, their aspirations and what are the strategies and tools that they use in order to thrive and survive and exist. Um, and so it was a long journey, you know, um, my coursework ended two years ago, um, but, you know, it, it took me two years to write my thesis, but for me, um, I could have just taken the test, right? Um, but I wanted to have something tangible that will speak to, again, the, the stories of my sisters. Um, and so, yeah, I don't even know how people can have access to, but I, all I know is that it is in the library. So people can actually like look for it. Uh, Desgreñadas y Rasguños, uh, Trans Latinas, uh, you know, telling their stories. Um, so, so yeah, people can have access to it and, you know, have a good reading, 
you know, I think it's like 143 pages, um, which is, you know, it's a lot. So I still have to like digest and see what else we can do with it. Um, but yeah, people can look it up and check it out and, you know, yes. let me know. Yes, I'm, I'm so excited to, to read it and to assign it. And um, I, I'll tell you, Bambi, I feel honored to, to be working in the department that you studied in. And I know it's not a, a perfect department by any chance. No, no department, academic departments could possibly be. But, you know, I'm honored by the fact that you and so many other fierce students and scholars have worked in this department. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your presence with us and doing this work. I'm really grateful. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, like I was so grateful, um, you know, when I learned that you were going to be in the department and also I learned that Rafael was going to be in the department. And then, you know, when I learned that Jack was almost going to be there, you know, but then, uh, you know, and unfortunately, you know, I I wasn't there when all of that took place, but I, I was there, obviously, uh, in spirit and also like, you know, working with all of you in the department uh, to complete my thesis. So um, thank you so much for you know, for being there, just your presence there, it means a lot to me and I'm sure to many people. Gracias, Bambi. And I'm confident that, again, you and so many other queer and trans folk who have continued to push academia is the reason that Rafa got his job, that Jack got their job, that I have my job, right? The fact that Cal State LA Chicanx Latinx Studies uh, created a position for Joteria Studies, which is what Rafa's position is. It's a big deal, right? Like no, no doubt about it. And it's happening in different places. And it's because of the work that you all are doing, the work that that Ethna and Karma are documenting, Suyapa, right? Like I, I really just want to honor all of you because we're making changes, right? Like there are different things happening, um, even in academia, which can be spirit murdering. But I always say that I believe strongly that queer trans and mujerista um, activists and scholars and are, are, are spirit restorers, right? Like we restore and protect each other's spirits collectively. So thank you for being part of my spirit protector, spirit, spirit restorer team, appreciate you. Uh, Rafa, do you wanna open it up to questions? Oh, you're so muted. muted. Jeremy or Rafa, I told you, I told y'all, I always do it. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that, Anita, because I feel right. I mean, I even brought Eddie to Fullerton. Aquí estamos todos, right? We're, um, aquí estamos en el mole. So I, I think this is a perfect segue. I just have one more last question, then we'll go into the question and answers. And so many of you who are part of this panelist are scholars in ethnic studies and gender and sexuality programs and departments and your leaders in migrant rights and queer trans rights um, organizations. And so how does this book, and this is for anybody on the panel, um, how does this book elevate our work in ethnic studies and those of us who are doing Joteria studies? I'm not a Jack. Yeah, I would love to hear from Jack on this. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think, you know, I think in my work, even right, talking about the trans ethnic community, there's always this divide between, between those parts, right? Between those parts of, of identity in terms of what it means to be trans as sometimes or often being synonymous with white and what it means to be Latinx, often being synonymous with being cis heteronormative, right? So I think that this book, um, both queer migrations and queer and trans migrations, you know, this book now really, it continues to build this bridge that is missing in, in the link to put those two disciplines um, in, in conversation with each other, right? And so I think that that's, 
this is a book that can not only be taught in now my current department of or program of women, gender, and sexuality studies, right? But that it's awesome that you could teach this in a Latino studies, Chicano studies class or any other kind of ethnic studies class, right? To think about what it means to be a queer trans person, right? At, at, with these different parts of these different intersections of being a migrant person in terms of legal status, in terms of a, you know, um, so I think it's 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 a huge push forward, right? And like it just continues to build that bridge to to put these 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 um, things in conversation. That again, coming to the work that's being done on the ground is not separate. It, it you know, like um, especially in places like LA, right, where where there is a huge queer Latinx community that is at the forefront of, of mobilizing, even in thinking about, you know, the work that Rafa talks about or the, the youth um, uh, migrant rights movement, right? Where, where so many people are, or the undocu queer movement, I'm sorry. Um, it, there, that intersection is always there and has always existed, but there's still this, this assumption that these are, separate things right and so in my work that's something that and i'm not the only run right i think that's what's beautiful about poteria studies about um this anthology uh, about queer migration studies in general right that that it's building this bridge of of putting these things in conversation because queer and trans people have always existed right um within these spaces within latinx um communities within ethnic within um, these different social movements, right? They've always existed and have always pushed these, these movements forward. So I think this is just another um, part of, of kind of pushing us forward in that direction to, to um, in documenting that. Gracias. I don't know if you want to continue the spirit that Bambi chose to do popcorn style. You can feel free to name the next speaker. I think since we, we haven't heard from you, Rafa, you know, and you're also a contributor, you can definitely go next because we'd love to hear about your work and also your thoughts on this. That way Rafa learns. que aprendas. <laughs> oh, man. So oh, there. Uh -oh. <laughs> I knew that that makes me laugh every time you say it. That's why I learn. Um, okay. So a little bit about my, my piece, I really feel that my piece was really trying to connect um, undocumented migrants, specifically undocumented queer youth, um, um, Latina, Latino, Latina ex-migrants um, who live in Miami, who live in, in, in South Florida, and to really connect their regional history to like a migrant labor geography. Right. I really wanted to make that connection that we can't talk about, like say these um, queer undocumented Latinx geographies without connecting it even to um, black migrant geographies that existed and built Miami. And, and I wanna share that because, you know, traveling for the last five years, now six to the region really um, opened up um, so many new learnings for me and specifically about space and how space really impacted me and influenced my writing. Whereas here I was, you know, um, you know, traveling the Southeast and then coming many, you know, arriving many times in Miami and learning its local history, right? Lo um, how it's being built and then how there's this Latinization of the city and who is included and excluded within that, um, you know, those, that language of like diversity, right? And inclusiveness that emerges after, you know, World War II and after the civil rights um, movement. And so what I really wanted to do um, again was to really make these connections that current, right? Current um, undocumented migrants share a history with, um, you know, black um, migrants who built Miami in, you know, at the turn of the 20th century. And, and that's what I was trying to do. And the way I did it was like, literally when I was walking down these streets in Miami and I would come across historical cities, I mean, historical neighborhoods that used to be called Color Town, Overtown, Overton, sorry. 
And then to see that the, the whole city, which, which actually was home to some of the richest black migrants, right, in, in South Florida. And to just know that urbanization, urban renewal, pretty much destroyed these neighborhoods, right? I mean, I would walk by them and then you had freeways that were developed on top of them, right? And so I really wanted to make that link in my piece. And, and, and I think what we can really offer um, to, to the field of ethnic studies is the role of like patriarchy, right? The, um, the role of, 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 of how these policies, right, are also in many ways um, surveillancing uh, gender and sexuality uh, of migrants who, who are living within these spaces and how that's really connected even to like um, urban development. And, and so I, I really wanted to, to, to make those connections. And, and I think it's, it's useful um, for us in, in, in ethnic studies and in Joteria studies to, to begin to talk about a, a spatial analysis because we, you know, we have homes. Right, we live in homes, and, and and we create space in nightclubs, and we create spaces in in, in boulevards, and, and we congregate, and we take up space. And so I, I really wanted to um, talk about that. Anita, can I jump in real quick just to say something also about Rafa's piece, piece which I think is really important, and I think it's it's really resonant with this moment right now when. You know, if you're looking at Twitter and Insta and everything, everyone's questioning like, okay, can we agree that Latinidad doesn't exist like, or, you know, did it ever? And I think that's one of the things that Rafa's piece does really well is it sort of foreshadows this moment because part of what he talks about in the essay is how these undocumented Latinx youth are negotiating the, the, the Cuban power structure in Miami and trying to figure out how as, you know, you're we're all Latinx, but how do we negotiate this essentially white power structure that is Cuban, that's Latino, um, in ways that can help us to do what we need to do in terms of getting the work done, but that also doesn't necessarily, necessarily sell out to those uh, assimilationist politics. And I don't think that um, insight could be any more salient right now. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that that's another piece of work that um, his essay does. Absolutely, thank you for connecting it to the current moment, right? Awesome. Because um, you know, it was one of the things that we talked about earlier. In we had we held space for post-election processing, and um, st students were were you know just kind of come, students and colleagues were talking together. But it's like, how do we take accountability for anti-blackness and 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 anti-indigeneity and commitment to the delusion of white supremacy? if we don't even understand this complex category of Latino, Latina, Latinx identity, right? And so some of us can articulate it, but even though some of us, you know, who are doing the work still can't. And it's because we've been siloed right across the country. We don't know about Latinx people in Georgia. We don't, we didn't know about Latinx people in um, Nevada, in Kansas, in Michigan, in, you know, and so, it's just really important for us to keep having those conversations. So thank you so much for, uh, for bringing that up. I know that Laura um, has been looking at the Q&A. Yes. And there's lots of great questions coming in. So I'll let her uh, take over for, um, with the Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you everyone, first and foremost, for being here. Laura here from the Cross Cultural Center, um, the assistant director there. Um, and so, like I said, like uh, Anita shared, there's a lot of great questions coming through. I'm going to post them in the chat that I encourage folks to share emails with each other. I do know that Maurice um, asked about um, certain uh, research. They're an immigration attorney who specializes in removal defense and is currently representing a trans woman from El Salvador. So I encourage anyone who has resources to share with Maurice. I do want to jump into one that I think Suyapa kind of touched on, but from Blanca. Blanca asks, can you share if you have an, you've seen an increase on the U.S. giving refugee status to gay, lesbian people from Central America? If not, what are some of the problems you have identified and what are the solutions to increase their status so that they may remain in the U.S.? That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, refugee status is usually granted um, to countries that have seen, that the U.S. recognizes as having had war or it's usually like, a, and, and, and then Karma can, can jump in here, usually like a war status and because there was a war and then now there's refugees that the US has agreed to uh, house. And because Central America and El Salvador and Guatemala 
were not the the war and the the incredible violence over 250,000 murders mostly indigenous people in Guatemala over 80,000 murders in El Salvador uh, thousands of disappearances uh, children right who were um, you know disappeared and 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 or adopted um, there's been the U.S. has never acknowledged their role so they had never they have never seen, they have never said that there was war there. I mean, Clinton kind of apologized, Obama kind of apologized, but you know, we're talking about you know, 50 years of war in Guatemala, uh, genocide against indigenous people. So because that hasn't happened internationally, Central Americans were not seen as refugees. In fact, when I came here, I'm a child migrant who was detained in the early eighties with my mother and we were not eligible for refugee status because you know, if Reagan were to admit that there was war in Central America, then, um, you know, they would be uh, facing charges and genocidal charges. But Reagan died very comfortably of old age, right? He never had to face trial for his uh, criminal activity and destruction of our entire lives in Central America. So we are not seen as refugees. And so the big, there's been pushes to organize around this, but until that happens, there's no refugee status granted to Central Americans. The Central Americans that have refugee status are at the time were Cubans and Nicaraguans uh, who were fleeing leftist rule, right? Le like uh, uh, leftist Cuba or uh, when the FSLN won in Nicaragua in 1979. And that's, a, that's kind of like a, a very interesting group, right? That, that uh, Rafa, you know about very well. <laughs> so in, in Miami and, you know, uh, I don't consider that the Latino vote, just for the record, when I, I don't know what that is, but it's not the Latino vote. Anyway, so, but, um, so what people are getting is um, they're getting a couple of things. Um, one is if you're in this, if you are in the US and you get caught, then people file or the attorneys file for withholding of deportation which is like a sucky status to have because you can't leave the country. You know, it's kind of like TPS or DACA, but less like, like you know, you do get a work permit, right? So withhold of deportation. The other um, is uh, under the Convention Against Torture Act, right? Uh, people are able to file for some sort of asylum status. And so that, that's just to, to define the different things, right? Uh, for Central Americans, what we've seen is a decline in granting stays or a decline, in, at least I don't have any numbers in front of me, but um, there's been increased deportation. So um, last year, uh, my class, uh, so speaking about this literature, I'm always so thankful to uh, Edna Lubade, who we've never met and, and Karma because, because of your, incredible writing, I can actually teach this in the classroom, right? So these books are incredibly important in, in Chicanx Latinx apartments because, you know, if, if we don't tell these stories, we don't exist in those apartments. And so we can't teach those classes, we can not include them, right? So, um, and so the, I don't have figures in front of me, but my class, one of my, my class on queer migration, we accompanied about 50 women from Central America who were detained at Purcell, Texas. And what we did is we wrote them letters, we put money into their accounts so that they could buy food or, right? And, um, and took their calls. Uh, sometimes when people are in detention, they're, they need acompañamiento, you know? Like they need to, to hear that someone's on the other line and that they can hear a Honduran, a Salvadoran, a, a Guatemalan, it's so important. And I could tell you not everybody got through. Not everybody was able to receive asylum um, you know, there were people who were deported. There were HIV positive people who were deported, knowing that uh, particularly Honduras has the highest rate of HIV positive status and uh, with very little resources, right? The, you know, there's, there's very little resources um, in the country for folks, uh, trans folk and, you know, so people got deported and it was so shocking to me because before Trump, there was a little bit of more success, right? It wasn't great, but it, it was a little more successful. And then post-Trump, you started to see deportations and, and just people, you know, I met a woman through um, the Transgender Law Center and Familia uh, Transqueer Liberation who had been in detention for five years, 
imagine that in detention for five years. And recently, uh, through the reporting of Abra Abogado and Reveal, we learned that there was a young woman who had also been in detention for five to seven years. This is really unconscionable torture, right? Um, and, and, and the harm that that does. And, and let's not even talk about the murders of Roxana Hernandez and Joanna and you know, countless Guatemalan indigenous children. So, so that's, that's what we're seeing, you know, um, and the, the comrades back in Honduras keep telling me, you know, people are coming back. And I, I did meet trans women in 2018 who had been deported from Mexico. Again, Mexico being the worst place to be trans at this moment in time in history, let's just be honest right? Um, the level of torture that people are facing in detention there, like that's, that's something to study, um, you know, uh, COVID, what, post, I don't know, post COVID, if we ever get post COVID, right, we need to really start working with our Mexican colleagues uh, and their studies of, of what's going on in Mexico, because that women are saying that's where they're facing the worst violence, right? Um, and, and, and sort of like, even though it's violent in the U.S., it's, it's almost like a desired thing to be, you know, to get in, right? But then you're not successful when you're getting in. And I don't know, uh, I'm gonna just be quiet and, and turn it over to other folks who have something to say. I do wanna do a quick time check. Thank you so much Suyapa for that very informed um, answer. Um, we do have a couple more questions we wanna get through. Like I mentioned, I'm gonna try to balance and put some in the chat and share some, but since we are about six minutes away from the closing of this event, um, I'm gonna pose a question that Maxwell Greenberg uh, posted saying, do you see intersections between trans queer immigrant justice movements and the indigenous resistance organizing happening on the border? Another way to ask is where does land slash climate justice show up in trans queer immigrant justice organizing? Organizing, does it show up? So I encourage folks to engage in the chat and to connect with, with each other as they ask, um, to answer that in community. Uh, but to close out, I do want to connect, like uh, uh, Catherine Funes asked, how do uh, LGBTQI co-conspirators who inform the different research in the book conceptualize justice? I think this is a great question. And what are material ways of getting there? And in connection with another question that I know the organizers wanted to ask was, uh, what are some advice that folks have for people in the movement who are doing the work, who are continuing to do the work? I know a lot of our folks who are probably our participants in this webinar are students and are a part of a lot of these movements. So in connection, like how do you all conceptualize justice? And then what advice do you have for folks in the movement? Go ahead, Bambi. Uh, so I think, you know, contextualizing, contextualizing justice is uh, pretty heavy, right? Because I think, um, I think even within our own, the multiple movements that, you know, that we're fighting with and for, right? Um, there's um, oftentimes conflict, right? And so what justice may look for me may look different from for somebody else right especially in you know within again multiple groups right but just to give you an example right like there are individuals who identified or considered themselves abolitionist right um and so and i can be completely honest right uh we have been uh criticized right for the work that we do for instance um right um we as an organization, uh, and I myself, right, um, want to obviously abolish ICE and abolish prisons and abolish the police and defund the police and all of these things, right? Um, because those are integral for our community. Um, but we also are realistic and to know that, you know, these industries are powerful Right, and it's not going to. It, the work is not, or, or the liberation that we're seeking, right, is not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Meanwhile, there are individuals who are continue to be detained, continue to be incarcerated. We just heard from Suyapa, right, uh, of a person who, who. Um, was there for five years, right? Um, and there's the 
the is not trans women are not the exception, right? Um, and so that's why we the work that we do, as I mentioned, right? Like we do it um, in multiple ways, right? It's not just one way. Um, so although we want as an organization to you know abolish all these structures, right? Um, we also know that our people continue to be detained and continue to be incarcerated. And so how do we also ensure that we support those individuals? And that's why we do campaigns to also, um, you know, uh, this year alone, we had two huge victories, you know, the campaign to free Alejandra mm -hmm. and the campaign to free Kelly. And now we're starting another campaign to free Kendra who has been in immigration detention for over two years. Um, and these are, again, individuals who have never been in the United States and the state is just, you know, holding them there for no reason, right? Um, and so, um, so that's why, you know, I, I think, one, we, we have to, to go back to the, to, to, to the question, right? Um, you know, like what contextualizing justice, I think, one, we need to, first understand what liberation means, right? Collectively, right? Because I mean, a lot of times we just turn, we just say like terms that we learn just to say them, but don't necessarily understand what that means, right? And so, and so I think in order for us to, to get or to find the liberation that we are seeking, right? Um, we need to obviously, you know, continue to fight, but fight in a way that is organized and then strategic, right? Um, and understand how this system functions so that we can combat these systems, right? Um, and so um, for us as an organization, that's exactly what we're doing. We are uh, making sure that we, you know, we, learn how the bullshit is, oh, sorry, how all of this, you know, how the game is played, if you will, right? Um, you know, and I'll tell you, like, when we first started in 2009, you know, we started as a grassroots organization, um, you know, doing, like, really great work, but we didn't have resources, right? And so we know that money is power, and so in order for us to do that, we have to play this game of, getting into the nonprofit industrial complex, right? Um, and in four years, you know, when we started, you know, the service provision part of the organization and also the policy portion here in the state of California, you know, um, we have been able to build a, you know, $1.2 million organization in just four years. And, you know, we have 14 people working with us. We have people on the ground in New Mexico and in Colorado uh, supporting trans women who are in immigration detention, right? Um, and so, so I think we just have to really understand what that means, you know? And injustice for me is really um, for us to fight to ensure that trans people and trans women, particularly trans women of color and my sisters who are trans Latina immigrant and immigrantes, um, that, you know, we are, we get to live in a world to where we are not afraid to exist, right? We experience extreme institutional and interpersonal violence, right? Um, and so, and we get attacked simply because of who we are. And so for us, you know, it's empowering our community, even if it's through direct service provision, right? First, so that we can continue to organize. And if our people have the basic things that they need, then they are going to be able to organize and do the things that we need to do, right? Uh, while at the same time, we are changing or influencing the structures that continue to marginalize us through policy change, through making sure that um, legislation is, um, to making sure that legislation is, um, that it speaks for our community, right? Um, 
and I know that I'm taking a lot of time, but this is really important, right? For the first time in the state of California, a piece of legislation was signed by the governor that it was organized, crafted, pushed, mobilized all the way to the governor's desk. And that is Assembly Bill 2218, which is a transgender wellness and equity fund, which is for the first time, the state of California is gonna have a fund that is specifically dedicated to support and allocate resources to trans lives. And so that is the work that we're doing. We also, you know, um, we also push for Senate Bill 132, which is the Respect Agency and Dignity Act, which is will give trans people who are incarcerated the agency to be able to choose where they will do their sentences. And this is work that the Trans Latina Coalition has done. And um, again, we're doing the work in a multiplicity way. And to us, that is justice. Gracias, amiga. You are visionary, you are inspirational, and you honor us. Uh, we're out of time, friends. Um, and I just want to say one more time to all of you, to, to Suyapa, to Karma, to Ethna, to Bambi, to Jack, you honor us with your time, your work, your energy. Um, thank you for being our spirit protectors, our spirit restorers. Gracias to Laura for collaborating with us, to Rafa for asking us to do this panel, um, for doing the work of, of contributing and being one of the most amazing profes I've yet to know. And Danny as well. I think I, I'm, I'm surrounded by love and, and connection and deep relations both on in this space. And I, there's so many of our friends and community that are in, in the Zoom. We have 62 folks uh, the, the day after the election and with all of the uh, chaos that it has caused in our lives. Um, and will continue to cause, regardless of of the um, of the results. I just want to hold this moment as a time that will continue to give us hope and energy. Um, if anybody would like to say any words, I welcome them. If not, we'll thank all of our friends who are on Zoom and Facebook and say goodbye. Anybody? No, no se vayan. I need a picture. ¿Qué dices, Bambi? I, um, I'm sorry, uh, but it, I, okay. I just wanted to like offer for people who like um, took the time to, um, to put the, the questions. And I know that the time is limited, but if any specific questions were dedicated, and I don't want to obviously volunteer anyone, but if any questions are, um, you know, dedicated, I guess allocated towards me. Um, I'm happy to respond them through email. Gracias, Bambi. And if anybody wants to share their contact, you can. But if not, Laura and I can commit to collecting the questions and, um, and sharing them with you all later. Gracias to everyone. Uh, if I can, I, yes, Mio. If I can please ask the panelists for a very quick photo. Um, virtual friends that I can't see. You're in this photo as well. I love y'all. And uh, you know, I always have to get a picture. One, two, three. One more because just in case anybody close their eyes. Wait, there's the chats keep coming in. Hold the chats for two seconds. One, two, three. Gracias. <laughs> Bam, I missed that one. One more, one more. <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> Andale. Gracias to everyone. Los quiero mucho. Les quiero mucho. Buenas noches. <laughs> Thank Good you. Night. Buenas noches. Share the pictures. Share the pictures. Share the pictures. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Karma. My loves. Thank you. Anita, if you want to get Monday. us on Facebook? Yes. Yeah. I just clicked stop live stream. Andale. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Thank you. I know someone raised their hand at the very end, but time ran out. I put my email in the chat in case anyone wanted to reach out and I can connect people if need be. Gracias. Gracias. Great conversation. Thank La you so Laura, much, the Laura. one thing I'll ask you is as soon as the recording gets downloaded or they send you the link, send it to us because I think we assigned it for our class. Perfect. And I know I, I said it to go on.